For those of you who don't know, I'm recovering now or fully recovered from my fourth heart attack. <laughs> to God be all the glory for the great things he has done of where which I am glad. Somebody said it's good to see you. I said it's good to see you. It's good to be seen and not viewed. Amen, <laughs> somebody. Y'all sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. All, all of this heart attack reminds me is that our God is a faithful God. Amen. And when men don't know what to do, our God always knows what to do. So, of course, while I'm sitting at home, y'all, me and God are conversing. We're talking. We're hanging out, just me and the Lord. And I had some questions for him. Lord, why? Lord, what shall I do? Lord, how shall I do what I do? Have you ever been in a place where you've had questions for the Lord? You needed answers to your questions, and God was just... You could hear the, the crickets chirping. It's <laughs> just, just silent. But finally, when I did hear from the Lord, it came to me out of Matthew chapter 5, the first word that I received. I want to read it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. No, nobody ever promised you that while you live that there would not be trouble in your life. <laughs> That there would not be some sickness and some pain. That there may not be some abuse and some death, some financial troubles. That no, no, nobody ever promised you that there wouldn't be frustration, disappointment, family injuries, abandonment, loneliness, stuff that you have no control of. And the Lord reminded me in that moment that, you know what? When I'm asking why me, the Lord said, why not you? <laughs> Y'all remember Job, don't you? The, 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 question, the question came uh, to, to the enemy when the enemy uh, went before the throne of God, Satan himself, come on. He said, where are you coming from? He said, oh, I'm coming from here and there. And the Lord said, have you considered? Uh, essentially, what God was saying is, I got a man named Job who is a righteous man, who is skewed evil, that, that he prays for his children every day, and he, he serves me. He said, have you considered him? All you theologians, don't get mad at me. I'm not comparing myself to Job. But the question, of course, and the reality of my struggle was, Lord, what and why? And God began to speak to me out of Matthew 5, and he spoke to my heart and said, listen, in this life, you're going to have some trouble. Jesus said it in John 16. He said, in this life, you're going to have some trouble. He said, I told you all this stuff that you might have peace, but you need to know that if you live a human life, there's going to be some, we tell somebody and tell them, you're going to have some trouble sometimes. The question is not whether you have trouble or not. It's how you deal with the trouble. It's not whether you get knocked down. It's whether you got enough sense and enough Holy Ghost, come on, not to stay down on the ground and to get back up and start again. Many have taken blows to the chest and to the chin, and they've got knocked down, and they've chosen to stay down. But when you're a child of God, you really don't have that option, do you? When you're a child of God, there's something in you that causes you to get up no matter what the blow that you receive, no matter what the stuff that comes your way, no matter what issues you are faced with. Watch this. When you are down, you have to get back up because God is the kind of God who picks up, come on, and heals broken hearts and restores broken lives. In other words, as a child of God, I couldn't stay down. Maybe I wanted to stay down, but there was something in me that said, son, you can't stay down. You got to get back up again. When I began to pray, the Lord began to speak to me out of Jeremiah, the first chapter, and this word from Jeremiah, the first chapter, uh, uh, you know, I titled it the assignment because I felt like God was giving Jeremiah a direct distinct assignment of what he was supposed to do. Now, Jeremiah is blessed, right? He's blessed because, here's the thing, God told Jeremiah what he was going to do. He ain't told me what I'm supposed to do. 
Jeremiah got a direct word from God, watch this, on his assignment. He said, I'm going to make you a prophet unto the nations, and you are going to tear down and build up. You're going to prophesy. God was real clear with Jeremiah, but for us, we have to discover what God has told us to do. We have to discover the assignment. And so I wanted to encourage you today that no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, where you are in your walk, watch this, wh whether you're dealing with frustration, disappointment, family issues, abandonment, no matter where you are, I need you to know that God still has an assignment over your life. I need you to know that no matter what the struggle, no matter what the issue, God still has called you. God still has anointed you. God still has a plan for you. What is an assignment? An assignment is a specified task, a specified task or amount of work assigned or undertaken as if it is assigned by an authority. Somebody say by an authority. You've got to know that God has assigned you, come on, to do specific things here on the earth and nobody can do like you can do what God has assigned you to do. That's why you shouldn't be jealous of other folk. Why? Because if I spend my time being jealous about what God is doing with you, come on, I'll never discover what God wants to do with me. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me in here. If I'm always focused on your stuff and hating on you and tearing you down, I don't have time to fulfill the assignment that God has given on me, given to me. Why? Because I'm distracted about what's going on in your life. Come on, we need to learn how to focus on God and take our focus off of other folks. Can you say amen? Once you have discovered your assignment, watch this, what God has assigned you to do, listen, you need to know that you will connect with purpose and destiny like nobody's business. Here's the thing. I know I'll be a preacher until the day I die. I might be preaching on the beach in Aruba selling mango smoothies and, and marrying folk, but if somebody walks up to me, I will have a word for him, Elder Friend. I will have a word for him, Pastor Darry. I will have a word. Why? Because I know that God has created me and designed me to do this thing. You call me 2 o'clock in the morning, you might be liable to get a sermon on the phone after I pray for you and encourage you. Why? Because I know God made me this way. He wired me this way. Come on. And all I did was say yes to the assignment that God has over my life. That's why these heart attacks don't cause me to trip nor stress. You know why? Because it ain't over until God says it's over. Oh, oh, God, I wish I had two witnesses in the room. It ain't over until God says it over. The heart will beat until God says it won't beat no more. Come on, and if you catch me on a good day, I'll say God bless you. And if you catch me on a bad day, I'm going to say God bless you too. Why? Because I know that my Redeemer liveth. And because He lives, I can face tomorrow. All right, let me get to this message. Y'all done had so many other things going on. I need to be able to preach. Man, I've been sitting on this word for two months. I hope y'all are awake out there. Watch this. God had an assignment for you before you were ever created. It, but isn't it interesting he never asked your permission what he assigned you to? <laughs> isn't that just like God? He already designed the assignment. He already created you for the assignment. He already wired you for the assignment. He already hooked you up way back here. Before your mama got a gleam in her eye, before daddy got a pep in his step, God had already decided, watch this, God had already decided your life. And you say, man, I had to go through some hell. Will you touch somebody and tell them you're still here? You're still here. You're still here. And if you're here, you might as well make the best of the life that God has given you. Quit complaining about how you got here. The fact is that you're here and God has blessed you to have life. He's blessed you to have hope. He's blessed you to have a second chance. And you ought to take advantage of it. Before you ever showed up, the Bible says, God told Jeremiah, he said, before you were formed in the mother's womb, I knew you. Somebody say, I knew you. It means I was intimately involved and engaged with you before you ever showed up in the spirit realm, before your spirit ever connected with your body, before the sperm ever connected with the egg. I had already written your DNA code, your D-O-ribonucleic acid. Watch this. And your DNA determines how tall, how skinny, how fat, how brown, how whatever 
whatever you're going to be was already predetermined by God. He wrote the genetic code on who you are. That's why you look the way you look, not because you go to the gym, not because you work out. It's because God has already written a script on your life. I wish I had a witness in this building. God knew you before you ever were. Come on, and he already set the path and the course of your life. Watch this. He created you with an assignment in mind. There's nothing that happens in your life that God is not aware of. God placed in you everything you need to accomplish that assignment. Just touch yourself and say, I'm fully equipped. Yeah, stop, stop complaining about what you don't have. Come on, stop complaining about the lack of resources. Stop complaining about the money. Stop complaining about all that. Why? Because God has given you every, somebody say everything, that you need according to life and godliness. That means whatever you need, watch this, all you got to do is walk in it like you already got it. Oh, I wish I had a witness. And, uh, but why? We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And if I need it, God's got it. And if God's got it, that means it belongs to me already. So all all I've got to do is walk like I got it. Y'all ain't helping me in here. You got to learn how to walk like it's already in your hand. You got to learn how to declare like it's all, why you have the power to speak those things that be not uh, as though they, uh, oh God, as though they already are. So whatever you're lacking, come on, you just need to start declaring what thus saith the Lord. Uh, come on and watch what you don't have uh, come into your hands. Why? Because God uh, will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Yeah, God placing you everything you need. I'm, I'm, um, I'm in this doctoral program right now, and, and you all will be surprised to know that my mother prayed that I would graduate high school. <laughs> Y'all think I'm lying? She can give the testimony right now? I felt like she came to me one day on my senior year and said, are you going to graduate? <laughs> because <laughs> it was real close, somebody, amen? And how in the world could somebody who struggled to graduate high school walk into a room with PhDs and doctoral folk and be able to sit down and, 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 and articulate what God is saying? That's not to boast me up. What I'm telling you is if God is leading you somewhere, he's already equipped you with what you need to be able to function and to succeed. God will never send you someplace that he had and already supplied you what you need to be able to be successful when you get there. Watch this. You were built to complete your assignment. Somebody write that down. If you're not writing nothing down, you were built to complete your assignment. That there is nothing that God has assigned you to that you cannot do. Jeremiah, it's funny, God called Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, uh, I've called you to be a, a prophet unto the nations. I've called you to be anointed. I've called you to do all this. And all Jeremiah can say is, oh, no, Lord. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a boy. I'm young, right? And how many of us in this room have suffered with self-doubt at some point? Self-doubt. You've been assigned to something, and God says, this is what you're going to do. And you're like, oh, no, nah, I don't think that. No, you must be talking to my next-door neighbor. And he said to Jeremiah, oh, no, say not that you're a child. Don't say that, because that right there is not acceptable. He said, listen, and he gave him the word of the Lord that encouraged him to say, in spite of all of your doubt, in spite of all of your fear, in spite of all of that, you're going to do what I said. Yes. Psalms 139, verse 16. Look at what it says. Your eyes, this is the CEB version, your eyes saw my embryo and on your scroll every day was written that was being formed for me. Before anything had happened, watch this, your, uh, before anything had happened, God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. You see that? Is that different than mine? Your, your plans, and the CEB version says, your plans are incomprehensible. Somebody say it's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible that God could look down the annals of time and decide and design where you would show up and how you would show up and the family you would be born into, even if it wasn't the best circumstance and best situation. Watch this. God is so much God that he allowed you to live through all of that so that you could be all that God has called you to be. Anybody here came up in a little bit of a crazy family, a little bit of a dysfunctional family? Maybe mama wasn't there, maybe daddy wasn't there, or maybe they were both there, but there was still some dysfunction that went on in the family. Maybe there was some... 
abuse. Maybe there was some sickness. Maybe there was some divorce. Maybe you didn't have enough money, right? Who of us can say that we haven't lived in a situation in a time where stuff just wasn't perfect? Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, we are what? God's handiwork created how? To do good work, which God prepared when? Pre-birth. Pre-birth. Here go God, right? Hooking you up. And you like, but wait a minute. I had to go through all this frustration, all this disappointment, all these family issues, all this abandonment, all these struggles, all these curses on my family, all these crazy folk getting drunk, all of this abuse. And God said, yep, yep, you got to go through all of that. But isn't it amazing that God doesn't show us the whole picture? God just says, listen, I've, I set you up to be able to do good works, and you're going to do what I've called you to do. You know what has to happen, y'all? You know what has to happen? We need to get right here. Because there is a natural birth, and then there is a rebirth. And when we get to the rebirth, how many of you believe your perspective changes? Come on, when we get to the new life, how many of you believe God turns it around? And there's so many people who are hungry and dying. There are so many people who are suffering with all of this stuff, but they don't have any Holy Ghost. They don't have any Jesus. They haven't been renewed, rejuvenated, forgiven, restored, brought into the family of God. Because when I get to the rebirth, when I get to the kingdom, when I get to the foot of the cross, come on, here's what I can do with all of my struggle. Come on, even with my abuse, you know what I do? I lay it at the foot of Jesus. Come on. Even with my disappointment, I lay it at the foot of Jesus. Come on, even with my financial trouble, I lay it at the foot of Jesus. With my frustration, I lay it at the foot of Jesus. If you had to leave me, bye-bye. Come on, I'll leave you at the foot of Jesus. If a heart attack hits my body, come on, I lay it at the foot of Jesus. He says, cast all your cares uh, upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Uh, come on, and when I get to him, uh, it changes the way I see things. Uh, it changes the way I experience life. Uh, it changes the way, come on, my perspective is, and your perspective is directly connected to your purpose. You can never fulfill what God has called you to do if you haven't met the man uh, by the name of Jesus who heals our, our diseases. Uh, come on, he takes away all of our sicknesses. See, I've learned over these last few months that I must stay at the feet of Jesus. You know, because here's the thing. <laughs> On this side, when I had trouble, I had to get me a bottle of Hennessy. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Some of y'all got some Hennessy at your house right now. <laughs> huh? On this side, I had to smoke me a joint. At this side, I had to find me a woman that I could take all my struggle out. On this side, y'all talking to me? Uh, uh, on this side, I had all of these personal, emotional issues. My coping mechanism was that I needed something externally to fix my manhood and to deal with my pain and my brokenness. On this side of the cross, these were the things that made me who I thought I was. But on this side of the cross, come on, I don't need all of that external stuff uh, because the power power that I have uh, comes from the inside. Uh, it's called Holy Ghost power, and he restores me. And, and listen, and here's the thing. On this side of the cross, I got some of this same stuff. On this side of the cross, I got some sickness. On this side of the cross, I got some abandonment. On this side of the cross, I got some frustration. On this side of the cross, I got some financial troubles. On this side of the cross, I've got some disappointment. On this side of the cross, I've got some abuse. But you know the difference between that side and this side? On this side, this trouble is under my feet. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Come on, on this side, I've got the victory in Christ. On this side, I am free and free indeed. If you believe it, go ahead and give God a great praise. Slap somebody high five and tell them it's under my feet. Under my feet, it's under my feet. When I've been born again, blood washed and blood bought, all of this trouble means nothing to me. Why? Because in Christ Jesus, I have the victory. I have overcome the world, not because I am so good, but because he is so good. If you believe that, go ahead and give God a great praise. I feel like preaching in here today. Watch this. 
Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Where's my musicians? Y'all still around? Y'all come on out here and get on that organ for me. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 said. There hath what? No temptation. Somebody say no temptation. Temptation, trial, or test taking you that is not what? Which means we're all going through something. We tell somebody, tell them, I know you're going through something. You don't look like what you're going through. Yee! Somebody said to me the other day, somebody said to me, if you didn't tell me you had a heart attack, I wouldn't know you had a heart attack. Come on. You see some of those folks, they walk around with all this stuff on them. I ain't got nothing on me but the Holy Ghost. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And that's only because, Mr. Ketchum, that's only because, that's only because, watch this, on this side of the cross, come on, I realize, yeah, this stuff is going to come. This is a part of life. Listen, my trouble may not be your trouble, but we all got some trouble. Am I right about it? But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there has no temptation. Somebody say no temptation. No temptation. Test, trial, tribulation, or temptation taking you that is what? Not common to man. Amen. We all got some trouble. But I like to be part of that verse. You've heard me quote it a thousand times. Somebody say, but God is faithful. Say it again, but God is faithful. But God is faithful. See, this is what you need to remember in the middle of all your trial, your test, your tribulation, and your temptation. What you got to remember is that God is faithful. When you can't see him, he's still working on your behalf. Come on. When you can't trace his hand, you got to trust his plan. Why? Because God has a plan that sometimes we can't see the manifestation of it. Have you ever been waiting on the Lord and it didn't show up? Have you ever been waiting on your healing? It didn't show up. Waiting on the blessing? It didn't show up. But just in the nick of time, my God, God came through like nobody else could come through. How many of you know God is not moved by your time? Come on. He's moved on a kingdom time. Come on. He needs to make sure that nobody else gets the glory when he moves in your life. He specializes in showing up at the 11th minute and the 59th second. Why? When you're about to lose your mind, you can say, if God hadn't been for me, come on. Somebody say no temptation. I'm trying to help you to be faithful to your assignment because when you understand that there's no temptation taking you, that's not common to man. You won't be like Slep Rock. Oh, wowsy, wowsy, woo, woo. That's for the old folks. Right? You won't be that person who gets so low and so down. Oh, go ahead, baby. Y'all better put your hands together for that baby girl. Come on, she got stuff that we don't even got. She just won't receive it. Mama said, go do that. She's like, okay, mama, I'm going to go do it. But they looking at me. Ah. She wasn't even stressed. She was like, I'm going to go do this because mama said do it. How cool is that? What if we all obeyed God like that? What if we all received the kingdom just like a little child? Wouldn't that be cool? We wouldn't be kicking and scratching and fussing and fighting and, you know, trying to convince God to do it another way. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation taken, you're not coming to man. But God is faithful. Somebody say God is faithful. You need to remember God's faithful even when it doesn't feel like he's faithful. Let me move on. Where did all the time go? Y'all still with me today? God never assigns you to anything that he has not prepared you to accomplish. When you go back to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, look at what it says. This is what we're stopping here. I got 10 weeks on Jeremiah 1 through 10. Look, he said, before I formed you, that word form means to mold, determine, or frame. See, so here's the thing about God. He sets the end before the beginning. So God created you to be able to deal with the frustration that's in your life. God is so much God that he's already been to your frustration and he put in you what you need to be able to live through that frustration. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Come on. And he, he saw the disappointment. He knew the family issues. He knew that you'd be abandoned. You'd be left. You wouldn't, you know, have what you need. He knew that folk would walk away from you. He knew your daddy wasn't going to be there. God knew, watch this, about your financial troubles, the divorce, the sickness, the abuse. See, the problem is we think that God just finds out about stuff when it happens. 
You got to get a revelation, baby. God's already been in your trouble on the other side of your trouble and watch you shout over your trouble once you got to the rebirth uh, and once you got a new perspective on life. You got to know that God is not resp responding or reacting to your trouble. He's already been through it on the other side. Uh, he's been to your deliverance. He's been to your healing. Uh, he's been to your breakthrough. Uh, he's been to your pain. Uh, he's been to your tears. Uh, we have a high priest uh, who's been touched uh, with the feeling of our infirmity. There's nothing going on in us that God hadn't already checked out. I feel good, gooder than good. That's not even a proper English. Feel gooder than good. Watch this. Point two. God is aware of all of your pain. Can I say that? He's aware of all of your pain. Watch this. He equipped you to grow through it. Pain is a part of your process. <laughs> Here's the thing. People see the glory. People see you filled with the Holy Ghost and preaching the Word of God, come on, and doing the will of God, and they're like, "Woo, man, look at you, but they don't know the night you had to cry. Come on. They don't know the night you had to get mad and kick the pillow. They don't know the night. Say, oh, they see me and Christina. We just so in love, which we are. Come on, but you don't know the night. She was like, Negro, get out the house. Just you. You on my last nerve. Come on. And, well, I never did that to her, but she did it to me all the time, so I'm just saying. <laughs> I can say that because I got the mic. You understand what I'm saying? But that's the contents of the law. Yeah, we're in love, but there were some times that she didn't even like me. You understand what I'm saying? And, and I've always liked her. But the point being, the point being, the, the, the point being, oh, you see it. Look, it took us 25 years to get here. Didn't it take us 25 years? Year five, she was ready to pack her bags, get in the car, and go back to Pittsburgh. You see the glory but you don't know the story. You don't know the nights we had to cry and pray and fuss and fight to get where we are today. We had to fight through the difficult, tough times. Come on. We had to fight through it. In other words, if you're married here, let me encourage you. Don't give up on your marriage. You've got to fight until God says differently. You've got to be willing to stay in there and fight to the glory of God. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Pain is part of your process. No pain. No gain. Pain is a teacher. Somebody say pain is a teacher. And prepares you for your specific assignment. Anybody here ever been sick? Anybody here ever had some pain that they didn't understand? Did it make you stronger than you were? Did it encourage you now to know that if you can go through that, you can go through? See, pain is a teacher because when you suffer and you go through, it teaches you how to pray at another level. It, it teaches you, come on, how to intercede. It teaches you how to trust God. The level of your trouble is indicative of the level of your triumph. The level of your pain is a predictor of the level of your purpose and your potential. If you have had to suffer much, watch this, you, God, will, the, the Bible says that you will reign with him. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, if we suffer with him, what? We will reign with him. So without no suffering, there will be no reigning. We, 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 want the, we want the, you know, frilly stuff in the kingdom of God, but how many of you know you got to go through something? Come on. You got to be willing to walk through something for the Lord. You got to be willing to suffer. Come on and go through whatever God is allowing you to go through. Let me say this. Without pain, there will be no suffering. Without suffering, we would never learn from our mistakes. How many of you are glad today that pain is temporary? You know, the old folks used to sing that song, I'm so glad. Trouble don't last always. <laughs> yeah, pain comes and goes. Let me hurry so I can move to a close. Can I say this to you, and I hope you're mature enough to handle it. God allows certain things in our life that help to humble us. Are you mature enough to handle that? Are you mature enough to handle that? Some of the hell you're going through, God let it happen. You do know if you're a child of God, the devil can't do nothing to you unless he comes through the Lord. 
you, you do know that God has you covered and protected. Watch this. And if he wants permission, he's got to go to God to get permission. Come on to allow things to happen to you. But God is so much God. He's like, dumb devil. Don't you get that? If you do that, it's just going to cause them to pray and get closer to me. It's just going to cause them to get deeper and more intimate with me. It's just going to cause them to connect with me at a different level. Is there anybody here? Your pain has pushed you into the presence of God in a new and exciting way. Come on, all the hell that I've been through. Come on, I've never prayed like I've prayed. Come on, since I had to go through. In other words, all of the pain and trouble that I've had to go through has taught me how to pray. Are y'all here today? Let me give you 2 Corinthians 12. And this is my point next to my next point. <laughs> Y'all, I've been out for two months. I need to preach this thing. Is that all right? Y'all all right? Yeah. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. The Apostle Paul now, the Apostle Paul was not always the Apostle Paul. He was Saul, y'all. And he was a persecutor of the New Testament church. He was a kidnapper, a killer. Come on, he was kidnapping kids, kidnapping families. Uh, saw, he thought he was all doing it in the name of God, not in Christ Jesus. And so he went to the, to the high priest and said to the high priest, hey, listen, give me some letters. I'm going to go down to Damascus, which is another city from Jerusalem, and I'm going to get me some more Christians, and I'm going to crush this Christian revolt. And on his way from Jerusalem, down to Damascus. The Bible says on Damascus Road, he's riding down the road and a light shone from heaven and this light, come on, knocked him off of his beast. Come on, and, and, and Paul went blind. Sometimes you need to know God will blind you to get your attention. I know y'all don't like this kind of theology. I know you want blabbing and grabbing. But listen, sometimes God will blind you to get your attention. Sometimes God will take you down so you realize you're not all that in a bag of chips. Come on, that God will take you down so that when you're down, you can look up. Paul, Saul looked up and said, who is this Lord? He realized there was something greater than himself uh, that was bringing him low so that he could be humbled and get a new revelation. And so sometimes uh, your pain is designed uh, so you can get a revelation of who God really is. Uh, you've been working on your own God. God's status. Uh, the devil is a liar. Come on, you've got to know God for yourself, uh, and God will allow trouble in your life uh, because he loves you so much, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. <laughs> Paul then becomes this great apostle, and Paul got some trouble. Someone say, Paul got trouble. Look what he said. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Of course, I am now referring to the wonderful things I saw. God took Paul up and gave him deep revelation on the church. He wrote 13 Bibles of the New Testament, 13 uh, books of the New Testament. He said, given to me was one of Satan's angels. He was sent to make me suffer terribly so that I would not feel so proud. Hold up. Wait a minute. Put a little Jesus in him. <laughs> this man of God who's casting out devils and rebuking devils and healing the sick and preaching and people are getting saved he you know and, and he's saying that there was a messenger of Satan that was given to me to buffet me to it's a thorn in my flesh so that I get so full of myself how many of you know pride is a terrible sin and how many of you know it wasn't just Paul that suffering with pride many of us suffer with pride too Oh, y'all don't want to say amen to that one, huh? Yeah, you thought I'm talking about Paul. No, I'm talking about you. You all bad, got it going on. You know, you slick willy. You know, you run and got it all. And right, and, and so what happens is we get so full of ourselves that we think we're more than we all, and we think more highly of ourselves. And the Bible says that the, the Paul, the great man of God, got a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. He said, I besought the Lord. How many times? And I would assume that when he was talking to the Lord, the silence. And finally God said, hey, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. 
for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to help you understand that sometimes the trouble that has come our way, come on, is to cause us to be humble and to cause us to go low and to cause us to remember Jesus and to remember that we're not all of that and a bag of chips because we can get out there and think we got it going on, but sometimes a little trouble will make you fall to your knees uh, and say, Lord, all to thee I owe. Come on, and God will deal with your heart if you believe it. Say amen. amen. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul says in verse 10, yes, I am glad to be weak or insulted or mistreated or have troubles and suffering if it is for Christ, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Point four. Everything is purpose for your good. When you're a child of God, watch this, everything is purpose for your good. Whether it be financial, divorce, sickness, abuse, loneliness, whatever it is, watch this, everything is purpose for your good. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that what? All things do what work together for the good. So even if the devil comes after you with his worst foe, God will take that and use it for his good and for, his, for your good and for his glory. Point five, watch this, change your perspective on pain and view it as promotion to your destiny. Let me say that again. Change your perspective on your pain and view it as promotion to your destiny. As I come, as I come closer to a close, I want you to grab this. I want you to grab this. As a child of God, on this side of the cross, when trouble comes, it's just trouble. But, no, on that side of the cross, I'm not a child of God. On this side of the cross, I'm a child of God. When trouble comes, you know what it is? It's an opportunity for God to show off in my life. It's an opportunity for me to trust God in a deeper and more relevant way. It's an opportunity for me to go back, come on to the basics of prayer and fasting and reading the Word and spending time with God. Listen, it's an opportunity for me to reconnect with God. My trouble, come on, is not supposed to cut me off from God. It's supposed to push me into His presence like never before and bring me a deeper level of intimacy with the Lord. Are y'all still here with me? Last point, your mistakes, failures, mishap, tribulation, and sickness does not cancel your assignment. I, 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 believe, I believe that when you get hit, that's a sign that you're moving in the right direction. Because, you know, the devil tries to withstand the movement of God and the kingdom of God. I believe that when you get hit with those things in life that happen, the devil tries to get you off track, just trying to get you, oh my God. That's why I told the devil, you have lost your last mind. You think if you hit me with another heart attack, I'm going to stop preaching the word? The devil is uh, a lie. You think I'm going to stop rebuking devils? Uh, you think I'm going to stop laying hands and believing for healing? Uh, you think I'm going to lie down and die? No, I can't lie down and die. I was made for this, baby. I was built to do this, uh, and I'm going to do it till the last breath in my body. Come on, and I'm going to lift up the name of God. Uh, let the devil roar. I've got victory in Christ Jesus. Uh, if you believe that, give God praise in this building. What I'm telling you is change your pain in the purpose. Let your pain, my God, cause you to press into the presence of God. Let your pain uh, cause you to come on, be elevated and propelled to a new level of destiny. On the day of Pentecost, it's interesting. Stand to your feet if you would. There was a man by the name of Peter. He was a disciple. And the Bible says that he, listen to me, that he forgot the Lord. When God needed him the most, Peter backed up on God. When God needed him the most, Peter wasn't there. But when Christ needed him the most, he was standing at the fire, warm in his hands. They said, you know him? The Bible says that he used some expletive words to say, no, I don't know him. He abandoned the Lord. 
How many of you here ever felt like you've abandoned God when he needed you? Jesus rises from the dead. He tells the apostles, go get my disciples and Peter. You mean the one that left you? You mean the one that wasn't there for you? You mean the one that warmed his hands by the fire and denied you? That's who you want us to go get? Jesus said, yeah, I specialize in taking broken people and using them for my glory. Watch this. And I have an assignment over Peter. He said, Don't you remember the word I sent out over Peter? He said, Peter, you are a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Just because he denied me, that don't mean I'm not going to use him. Y'all go get Peter. And on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost fell on the room where there was 120, and the Bible says cloven tongues like fire fell upon their heads. And they began to speak with the languages, come on, that, that were languages of the people who were surrounding. And they looked down, and they said, oh, those men up there are drunk. And Peter took the opportunity to stand up, and he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. But this was that. That was, oh, God prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour out my spirit. Open all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. In other words, even though Peter abandoned him, even though Peter walked away, even though Peter lied, watch this, and even though Peter was a punk in the moment, come on, the difference between the moment that he lied and deceived and the moment that he stood up and preached was the power of the Holy Ghost had fallen on Peter, and Peter stepped up to the plate and began to declare the word of God. You have an assignment. Don't let no devil in hell stop you from your assignment. Your job is to discover the assignment that God put on you and go after it with all of the passion in the world. Pursue God. To pursue Him with your everything. Your assignment has been given to you by the Lord. You are the way you are because God created you and gave you a task.